My opinion is that nobody should ever recommend that anybody try a hallucinogen. And the reason for this is simple and clear. Um, you cannot know how borderline you are until you've swallowed the substance. So this is a psychedelic, we'll go back to that word, um, and uh, psychedelics and hallucinogens have the power to um, uh, bring out psychosis. Um, somebody who's on the limits of psychosis, so it's not for people with psychotic issues, not for people who are borderline, not for people who have schizophrenia in their family. Welcome back to another edition here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Fakobekali, your host. Many interesting issues are flying about right now, but one thing for sure, this book, Plant Teachers, came towards me and uh, it looks, it takes a very close look at a couple of plants that were, I don't want to say new to me, tobacco everybody knows, but ayahuasca definitely is a plant I didn't know about. Why? Because sex, drugs and rock and roll may be fun, but drugs is something I definitely abstained from in quite a, let's say, disciplined way, if nothing else. I invited the author, Dr. Jeremy Narby, to the show to talk about this book and about the subject of plant teachers. Jeremy, so good to have you here on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Well, listen, um, you are an anthropologist by training. You studied in Stanford. First of all, I want to know a little bit about you. What made you study the human being? Why were you so interested? I think that the reason was that when I was 10, my parents uh, took me out of Montreal, Canada, and um, settled me into Fribourg, Switzerland. So I was transplanted. And um, even though it may seem um, uh, trivial to uh, outsiders, um, it was a fairly violent experience and uh, one that kind of put me in a front row seat of anthropology, but without even realizing it. I mean, for me, the, the question was, um, why are things so different here? Um, people speak French in Fribourg and Montreal. People, people have white skin. People drive cars, they even watch television, but it's not the same cars, it's not the same television, it's not the same food or the same sense of humor. Um, so why? Why are things different? Um, and at the time when you're 10, I mean, it's not an intellectual question, it's almost like a, a, a corporeal question or your body feels like, you know, I, I was... I remember like the first year I was in Switzerland, I was kind of revolted at having been extracted from my world and mm -hmm. culture and stuff. And even though as a young Canadian boy, I played ice hockey and in Fribourg, you could play ice hockey. So, uh, you know, uh, even though actually it, it was not like being a, somebody from the Sahara and being put down in the Amazon or anything, but there was still that question of, it, it was just uh, visible how um, how culture made a difference in just the the texture of things, um, and so and then, I mean, this is kind of a long winded answer, but you you asked the uh, the the question. Um, my parents were uh, Egyptian, Irish, English. Mm -hmm. I was born in Canada, transplanted in Switzerland, and finally I realized as I. I did my uh, went to university, studied history, and then finally ended up attracted to anthropology without even thinking about it. But then I read an article whilst just after beginning studying anthropology, why do people become anthropologists? This article asked, and it had studied the origin of anthropologists. And 80% of people who choose to do anthropology, according to this article, were people like myself from a mixed cultural background. And so the psychological answer to the question is, and I really fit into the statistic, you try to understand cultural differences in the world, 
because actually you're trying to understand cultural differences inside yourself. Um, you know, so that, that much is clear. At that point, by the time I was 22 or 23, what I was interested in was why are there rich people and why are there poor people? So it wasn't just the differences between Canadians and Swiss that was on my mind, but actually the differences between people in terms of uh, wealth uh, at, at that point. And so, you know, these are fairly naive questions of a young person 40 years ago. Um, the, the naive question was, how come there are these such big differences in wealth when there seems to be enough for everybody to go around? That was the, the question. And finally, as I was studying history uh, at the university in England, uh, a fellow student said to me, you know, uh, with what you're interested in, you should study anthropology. It, it, it is the study of differences between people, differences in race, class, and gender, for example. Go and study cultural anthropology. And so um, uh, I followed that piece of advice. I was fortunate enough to get accepted at Stanford. And, you know, as soon as I got into an anthropology department and started reading anthropology books, I was like a, a duck on a pond. It was like, ah, yes, this, this is exactly what I'm interested in. So, I think it's, uh, yeah, let me just interject there because it really hits a, a, a bit of a tone with me. You know, I also come from a mixed background and I was also during, you know, in uterus uprooted from, from Hungary and then was born in a, one country and grew up in different countries. So this cultural mix or the trauma of being transplanted from one, you don't need to call it country, it really is culture. You know, the, the, the way uh, people think, the way they act, the way they react to whatever I think is exactly what can traumatize a child, can traumatize anybody. But then also you either then study psychology or I guess anthropology, if you want to find out about, you know, how to deal with this trauma. But, um, you know, going a bit further, as you were saying, OK, this is exactly why what I'm interested in, because it just didn't it didn't stop with finding out about you, but it told you a lot about the Western society in where we are in respect or in comparison to other societies or cultures. Yeah, well, I think that once one has had uh, the personal experience of, of seeing that, uh, well, there can be two very different cultures, you can actually be in both. And you, you look at the other culture from the point of view of this one, you, you can kind of see a part of yourself from the outside like that. And so you know that each point of view has its limits. Um, and so, for example, for me, once I started uh, working with Amazonian people, it was perhaps easier for me than for uh, others uh, to see that uh, from their point of view, we looked really strange. The scientific, academic, anthropological gaze that shows up in the Amazon and starts asking a lot of questions to people about how they use the rainforest or, or whatever rational study, um, seen from the uh, indigenous point of view is a pretty, pretty actually suspicious uh, activity. And, but if you're just, if you just show up from the university library, you think you're there in the name of science. You think you're there for the good of humanity. I mean, you don't even, question the, the, the basic reasons behind, you know, you, you think you're actually doing people a favor by studying them. Yeah. Um, but um, actually, as I, I started being an anthropologist, so you actually do stroll out of the library and stroll into an Amazonian village at some point. Yeah. Um, I was pretty attentive to the, the fact that, um, they, they looked at me like I was a yep. really strange person. And, and I found that interesting. Instead of some, something, instead of it being repulsive, I was interested in how they uh, saw me too. I mean, I, that, I wasn't going to make that the subject of my study, but so whilst I was studying how they used the rainforest, mm -hmm. I kept an eye on the fact that they were keeping an eye on me. And, and actually... <sighs> their point of view on white people and especially white people with blue eyes and uh, sort of a beard um, was that uh, we are like 
underground vampires. Yes, yes. You talk about the white empires that come to extract and the way we are being seen as developed countries in primitive societies. And that is something uh, actually, you know, Jeremy, always bugged me that we would look at cultures, indigenous people at the prim as the primitive society. And I wonder uh, whether, you know, in the name of science or evolution, who is the primitive one here? Uh, looking at looking at the way that uh, our planet is facing certain, certain yeah. problems as well. Well, uh, the, the book uh, Plant Teachers, which um, appears to be about two plants, tobacco and, and ayahuasca, goes much further. It, exactly, it, it is also uh, about just that. Um, uh, so there is uh, an indigenous Amazonian way of understanding these plants and their therapeutic potential. And there is a scientific way of understanding these plants and seeing their potential and their dangers and so forth. And I don't think it's a one is primitive and one isn't or, or vice versa. It's that they are different uh, ways of looking at the same thing. And they're actually fairly complementary. Um, in other words, they, they are coherent points of view. Um, And they do reveal uh, verifiable things about the subject at hand. Yep. I mean, these two plans, but it could be another. It could be any other subject. And what is interesting is learning to combine these two points of view. I'd say, to, to put it very simply, that when uh, science looks at a couple of psychoactive plants, mm -hmm. um, it uh, will tend to objectify these plants. In other words, treat them as objects, objects of study, but also bags of molecules. Exactly. And not really, and especially when we're talking about plants as a being, as a sensitive being that can perceive- The learn. animist view, the animist view you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, so uh, the Amazonian people, when they look at a plant, before objectifying it, they personify it. So. It, it really is. They, they treat the plant as a subject rather than as an object. And then they go down that path and they get to know the plant uh, through a, a process that includes personification. And so they have another um, understanding or at least an understanding of the plant that's expressed in, in another language. But uh, it turns out that science has now discovered that plants are sensitive beings mm -hmm. that perceive, learn, remember, and communicate. That beings that are different from animal beings like ourselves, but still living beings that do these things. So plants are not just objects. They, they are also beings like ourselves. And so these two ways of understanding, one that objectifies, the other that personifies, are complementary. And I think that this is also one of the things that uh, our book shows, is that yes. half the chapters are, are by an Indigenous uh, expert, Rafael Chanchari, who, who speaks in his personified way uh, about these two plants yes. and, and about his knowledge and experience with them. Uh, here, I'll let you, I'll let you talk. I'll you talk know, exactly. No, no, you're here to talk. I'm here to listen. <laughs> I'm here to extract, you know, I'm the oh, white extract, vampire yeah. now extracting the knowledge and the wisdom from yep. you, Jeremy. But I think, um, you know, getting more into tobacco and Ayahuasca, mm -hmm. you're one of the pioneers really going and trying, trying out the real thing, the real tobacco. And we're not talking about cigarettes here. And mm -hmm. that I think there is like a misconception there too, or at least or a different experience when, when you smoke a cigarette to uh, what tobacco can be as a plant teacher or uh, Ayahuasca. And there's a couple of revelations, you know, when I looked at your book and I read the, um, The, the, the headline, you know, plant teachers, I thought, oh, there's a teacher teaching me about plants. So that was the first revelation that I thought, okay, no, no, no. There are plants that can teach us through ingesting them in certain ways. And that is the big difference. Talk us through, first of all, you know, the difference tobacco is being seen and used amongst um, the Amazonian, Peruvian Amazonian people. Yeah. Um Tobacco is, um, well, there are different 
species of Nicotiana plants, 76 different ones, but the, the two ones that are used for uh, tobacco smoking and cigars, cigarettes, and so forth, Nicotiana tabacum and Nicotiana rustica, mm -hmm. come from, um, well, the Peruvian Amazon, Peruvian and Ecuadorian Amazon. This is what uh, plant um, people say. So the people who have been living in South America have been working with these plants for, for thousands of years. They, these plants actually spread across all the Americas. It's very hard to find indigenous, apart from the Inuit, but from the, the south of South America, all the way up to the north of North America, through Central America. By the time the Europeans showed up in 1492, um, people, uh, everywhere were using tobacco, smoking it, chewing it, sniffing it, and so forth. Um, Columbus and his men set foot in what is now Cuba in uh, uh, October 1492, and they'd never seen anything like it. The, the uh, Taino people who lived there, they walked around with these leaves rolled into cylinders that they call tabacos, and they put a coal on the end of it, and then they suck or sip the smoke. And this makes them resist tiredness. And so, and this is how the Spanish uh, talked about it in 1492. I mean, they'd never seen tobacco, which is a plant that's indigenous to the Americas, and they'd never seen smoking. The, the verb to smoke was not even in, in European languages at, at that point. Um, it turns out that uh, the, the, and wherever they went in South America, the Brazilian coast or in Mexico or Florida, or actually the, the first uh, account by a European of smoking is Jacques Cartier uh, in 1534 in what is now uh, Quebec. And, and he actually smoked and then described it. And, and Europeans started taking tobacco with them back to Europe, but also all around the coast of the Portuguese introduced tobacco to the all of Africa and all of Asia. By, by 1590, the Portuguese had introduced tobacco all the way to Japan uh, through India. Um, yeah, uh, the Portuguese actually, as they introduced tobacco to Asia, they also introduced smoking. To our knowledge, nobody smoked. Uh, I mean, there, there seems to have been smoke inhalation, like you might breathe in incense in Asia before the late 16th century. But the idea that you would actually deliberately have a, a pipe or an apparatus or, and that you would uh, smoke in this way, this was something that was uh, all new. Um, it's um, the history of smoking, uh, the history of tobacco. It's a, a long um, story. I'll try to make it short. Um, it turns out that um, strong, dark Amazonian shamanic tobacco contains 20 times more nicotine than blonde Virginia tobacco. So how did that happen? Um, in indigenous, I, I'm, I'll talk mainly about indigenous Amazonian people because it would yeah. just get too complicated. Um, the first thing is that they see this plant as the number one medicinal plant, the number one teacher plant. Uh, really, it's, it's a painkiller. You can apply the leaves to, to wounds. You can blow the smoke on things. It disin it's a disinfectant. Um, and so it's used as a, it, it calms people. Um, it also allows the practitioner to um, um, do a diagnostic. So it's at the center of, of healing practices. Mm -hmm. And it, it's uh, not used as um, uh, entertainment. Uh, it really is about knowledge, about healing, um, and that's how they see it. And so, for example, the people that I lived with, the Ashaninka people, their mm -hmm. word for shaman, when the anthropologist comes in and says, so oh, you're shaman, well, sherry piari, sherry means tobacco. The word, in fact, so it's tobacco doctor. Mm -hmm. You want to, you have a problem, you need an opinion, you have an illness, you've lost your mojo, go and see the tobacco doctor. And the tobacco doctor will take some tobacco, the, the tobacco doctor might blow some tobacco on you. Um, so that's how important tobacco is for uh, indigenous Amazonian people. 
Europeans took it, and, and actually the uh, intoxication, because it's really strong, when you take a strong dose of shamanic tobacco, we're actually talking about something that's much more close to a hallucinogen. Yes, you know, exactly. Food. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so you actually, it makes your head spin, it can give you nausea, it, you can see images, you get all kinds of ideas. It's a psychoactive, I, I mean, we know now that nicotine goes and inserts into these different receptors, but it, when you take a a strong dose of, of uh, shamanic tobacco like this. It's a, it's a very strong um, experience. In fact, it can even be dangerous because you can die quite easily from an overdose. It is a poison used as a potion. I mean, this is exactly the interesting line there. And, psycho you know, not psychologically, but physiologically, the receptors that we have by nature as humans, you know, they, they love nicotine. They do, but and, and that's a very important point. But let me just finish answering the, the yeah. previous question. Um, what uh, happened is that, it, to, to speak quite simply, um, the Europeans who, who settled uh, so, uh, into North America, in Virginia in particular, um, they started cultivating. They, they studied how the local indigenous people uh, cultivated tobacco and dried it and so forth. And they worked on selecting plants that um, didn't make your head spin so much. Mm -hmm. And over the years, instead of it being dark hallucinogenic tobacco, it turned into blonde and, and fairly weak tobacco. Um, and that's exactly now uh, uh, your average uh, uh, industrial cigarette has 1% of nicotine in it. It's just enough nicotine to tickle the neurons. It's, it's, it's almost like when you, you have a, a, a motor, yep. and you, you don't put the gear, you go, bam, 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 bam. So you need then, to do it again and again and again. And, so and that's the about... why they, it's calibrated that way as yeah. well, because then it's actually calibrated so that you light the next one up as soon as possible. So what has been created with industrial cigarettes and to, to go to the punchline, they've taken, in, in indigenous terms, they've taken the number one and very powerful plant teacher, weakened it or turned down its volume so that you, you actually don't, hear anything so there's it's no longer teaching anything mm -hmm. and then they add up to 600 different chemicals to it to make it burn more to give it taste and and these turn into um uh, poisonous dangerous uh, substances carcinogenic uh, substances it, it it needs to be said that nicotine does not cause cancer it's not that the, the uh, nicotine does other things mm -hmm. uh, but causing cancer is not one of them um, so, um, and besides this is, a, it's a delicate subject, uh, tobacco science was, um, uh, waylaid by industrial interests. It's one of the, the great shames in science. I mean, peer reviewed journals were, were bought by the tobacco, tobacco industry. I mean, they, they created fake news, fake knowledge before anybody else, you know, they, they cultivated doubt so that it got to just absurd proportions, even though doubt is the method of science. I mean, you, you know, the tobacco science and the tobacco industry turned into a, a pretty ugly story in the 20th century, not to mention the millions of deaths that go with it. So, yes, this very powerful medicinal plant got turned into a, a watered down parody of itself, all sauced up with chemicals that is a, a global killer. Tix, yeah, toxin, exactly. Interesting. In the toned down version, usually, you know, dosage is so important to distinguish between something that does you good or does you harm. And here, uh, you know, putting all well, these chemicals in, as you were saying. You, you, you see, it's, uh, it may be that the nicotine has been reduced, but by weakening it that much, you yeah. then are smoking all the time. You will not see um, uh, tobacco shamans smoking their big cigars all day long. It's exactly. something that you ritualize. In other words, you do at a precise moment in space and time and for a reason. So they take huge doses of nicotine punctually. Yeah. Um, and this is quite different from constantly lighting up the next one, if only in terms of the cells in your lungs, because living cells divide occasionally. Mm -hmm. And if a cell is in the process of, of dividing and 
you start bombarding it with toxins, it's going to stop the process of division to protect the, the DNA. But if you're always continually bombarding your lung cells, um, there are going to be cells in there that are, are going to get caught at some point dividing and without being able to stop the process. And the toxins actually go in and break the DNA. Yes, and, and then it's called cancer. Eventually, it's called it, a it, mutation it's, and cancer. It yeah. causes mutations, and then it can become cancerous. So actually, it's not just that there are a lot of toxins in industrial cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. that people are permanently frequency. frequency. Well, let me then um, talk or let us talk a little bit more, Jeremy, about the teaching, because what I thought was very interesting was the question of truth, be it with the usage of tobacco. And I would love you to tell us about your own experiences uh, with tobacco in that environment down in the Amazon uh, and also with Ayahuasca, because I wonder about the difference as in, is it the truth one finds? Is it one's own truth? Uh, hallucinogens, they act on us uh, physiologically, but of course they transport us <laughs> into another world. And I wonder, can you put this a little bit into perspective, the actual effect and what you saw and what sort of truth you might have found out for yourself? Yeah, um, it's an interesting and uh, complicated question, mm. especially because tobacco and ayahuasca are also uh, different in terms of, uh, so, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to start answering your question. Yep. And I'll s s do that by starting with uh, tobacco. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually not a, a tobacco person. So um, <clears throat> even though it might not sound. <laughs> Which is about to say, are you sure? <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, okay. But, um, you know, it's just not my plant in, 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 in that. I mean, I, I've smoked, uh, and, but I, I don't really like it. And it, it doesn't, it's not something that I, I go after. Um, when I was with the Ashaninka, I did have this experience that I, I describe in the book. One day I was with a, a, a tobacco shaman who was my main informant, and he was about 48 at the time. And he took me to meet his old teacher, who was probably in his late 70s. But this guy was so old, he didn't even know his age because he was born before the Ashaninka started counting anyway. Um, Ah, the, this old man was all wrinkled and just sitting on his mat eating his tobacco paste. So they, they boil up this dark tobacco into a sort of a thick uh, jelly-like paste that they keep in uh, gourds with a stick in the gourd. And so then you bring out your stick and run it through your, you get this sort of dark tar-like uh, yeah. substance on your lips and there it is. Except, that, so I, after an exchange with the, the fellow, uh, I asked him if I could try his tobacco paste. And, and I did it uh, on a whim, uh, simply because I felt that um, uh, it would be a way of... Um, Integrating also, taking an interest, saying trying out, right? Yeah, and I was just there tagging along with my informant so that he could see his teacher. I didn't want to get in the way. And so, mm. anyway, so he, he gave me some, he gave me his gourd. I put a good dollop of his paste on, on uh, my lips. And then the experience, uh, so is it the truth? Uh, uh, it's certainly, I can try to give a truthful account of my experience, um, subjective experience. Um, the first thing is that it, it tasted like blood. Um, and apparently there is a connection here where between uh, tobacco and hemoglobin, but anyway, um, and metallic taste was it like a metallic taste then because I always feel yeah. when I have blood in my mouth is more yeah, know, more metallic a, yeah. A metallic and but still I mean blood is blood and at, the, at the, the, this moment I was a vegetarian so I hadn't actually tasted blood for a while and this really and and so and I found that it tasted good then I, I realized after about five or ten minutes into this that my, my teeth as I ran my um, tongue on, on along my teeth they seemed longer and sharper than usual mm. and <clears throat> then I felt like I had kind of whiskers coming out of, of the side of my face so this was obviously I was already getting intoxicated and uh, but the feeling was uh, warm um, 
kind of predatory, kind of excited. Uh, I started looking at these chickens that were just sort of clucking around. And, and I felt like, uh, oh, yes, I'm, I'm going to not attack them. You know, because otherwise, uh, and I had all these ideas going through my mind, like, uh, mm. Um, mm, yes, you know, the tobacco paste is strong when the anthropologist starts attacking the chickens, you know. So, um, and, but meanwhile, it, it was this exhilarating feeling of, of being almost like a, a feline. I was just about to say a beast came out in the positive sense. Yeah, like a, like a, a kind of like a jaguar. I felt like a, a benevolent jaguar, sort of smiling at the chickens, deciding not to attack them. And this, uh, and it, it was like being, uh, it was like when you fly in your dreams or something. It, it was a very thrilling experience, having the impression of being partially feline for 15 minutes. And... Um, I mean, obviously, I do not believe that I really did t turn into a feline, but um, I do think that that paste uh, gave me that impression. And in fact, that impression was so strong that I can still convoke it almost 40 years later. I've used, uh, I've channeled that moment um, many times, including before speaking in public. In other words, when you feel like a happy, warm um, uh, jaguar, it's easier to get up in public and to look at people, a smile and um, deliver the goods. But isn't uh, that, if I may interject there, I mean, that's exactly what is so addictive, let's say about other drugs like cocaine they say that all of a sudden you feel a charge you feel this you know another dimension uh coming out of you and you are more able to do something that without it you'd feel anxious about or wouldn't even do yes uh i think uh, your question is uh entirely warranted uh also for tobacco not just for cocaine but in my case and in the case of this story it is not warranted at all um, because, uh, but uh, you couldn't have known that because I hadn't said it yet. Um, not only was I not a tobacco person before this experience, but I was not a tobacco person after this experience. In other words, I found the experience of, of partially turning into a feline in my mind, um, exhilarating, not something that I could talk about when I got back to, was not something I was in a hurry to talk about, Mm. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. I was in no hurry to try again. I didn't want to return to that place. I'd, uh, I'd had the experience, thank you very much. And actually that experience was something, as I was saying, that I could return to simply by convoking it. Um, so it was a very deep and marking uh, experience, um, but not something that made me want to take tobacco again and again. On the contrary, in fact, Interesting. I, I, I like that because I see a bit of a difference feeling like a feline, but knowing you are not. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people on a trip or on a bad trip, mm -hmm. that line seems to blur. Well, that is true. I think that's a very pertinent uh, remark. And it's, uh, it's something that, I mean, you know, Western people have not been tripping for very long. So I guess that we're still learning how to do it. Um, the... Um, uh, it's true that I think that the Amazonian perspective uh, in terms of, okay, so you take tobacco or you take ayahuasca and then you turn into a jaguar, for example. What, what they mean when they say that, uh, if one puts it in Western words, at least here is my version of it, it's as if you turn into, so it's, and so then you think, so it's kind of like what we call make believe, but we think make-believe is just stupid stuff that children do. No, make-believe is the power of the imagination. And the human imagination is, is fantastically powerful. Um, and so, you know, they say, oh, that's just your imagination. Um, but no, actually, the power of cultivating uh, images in one's mind, of seeing things, of um, I... I have an idea of what it's like to feel like a feline. So that question of, so is this really real? Well, no, I, I do not claim that I really know what it feels like to be a feline. 
But um, I do have a, a deep body-based experience of something that feels like it might be getting closer to understanding what it means to be a feline without claiming to have that truth. And so it, it is that the, the, in the theater of your mind, you entertain films, but see, it's not just the mind, it's also the body. And that's one of the things with both ayahuasca and tobacco is that they are psychoactive, but they certainly affect the body at the same time. One of the things that, it, so if you want to do a, a kind of a chemical analysis of my Jaguar transformation experience, it, it is uh, uh, physiologically measured that what a strong dose of uh, shamanic tobacco does, in particular through the nicotine it contains, it makes your heart beat faster. Mm -hmm. It makes more blood uh, go to your brain. Um, you uh, secrete more adrenaline, more dopamine, more serotonin. Apparently, you can concentrate better for a while, at least. And so, and then you, they actually measure that uh, people do uh, with a certain dose of nicotine, not a, a huge dose, because once you get into very strong doses, it, it mm. becomes almost a, a delirium. But it's true that to a certain extent, nicotine. Uh, sharpens memory, sharpens learning, and it has clear effects on. Uh, so I was saying that I felt like a warm predator. Uh, it also releases testosterone. So uh, warm, so your your heart is beating more, your testosterone levels are up, your dopamine levels are up. You're, this cocktail of nicotine uh, being such a, a, a touching such a fundamental receptor as the acetylcholine receptor in the human mm -hmm. body. This has impacts on all other kinds of receptors. So by putting nicotine in your body, what you're actually doing is releasing a whole cocktail of hormones. substances, hormones that are, are already there. Mm -hmm. And if you have a big dose of nicotine, then it turns into this. And so uh, transforming into a jaguar, uh, you, you experience your body in a, a different way. It feels warmer, more powerful, and uh, suddenly you start thinking about attacking the chickens or not. Exactly. And this empowerment, I think, is what uh, gets a lot of people perhaps addicted. But let me just um, pick up on a sentence you said. I didn't really know what to make of my experience. And to talk about also messages um, being transmitted through these plant teachers to you. Um, and, and I wonder now in hindsight, do you actually think that if we had taken uh, the tobacco together, you know, I would have been on a different trip? So my message might have been uh, a different one. Can you actually make out now what, why you felt like a feline? Did you, mm -hmm. did you ever come across that? Oh, oh, now I know, know it makes sense because, or never. Um, well, uh, once again, uh, you ask a, a good question. Um, I think that there's, I can answer the kind of a two-pronged answer. The, the first part is that um, I was actually surprised when I started reading about uh, to shamanic tobacco, which I hadn't done before going to the Amazon, um, that um, experiencing a, a, a partial transformation into Jaguar is what often happens to people when they take tobacco. Okay. So, so there is kind of almost a template, usually. Yeah, almost a template. Like. Um, and then why this is so. Actually, I think that, and when I was giving that hormone-based explanation before, I, I, I should have said that I didn't mean to um, make that a, a, a reductionist explanation and say the hormones explain it. Mm. Um, but I do think that the hormones are part of the experience. And then just why that particular cocktail of hormones translates into Jaguar transformation. I mean, I, we would get some psychologists in on the job and to, to weigh in, and I haven't gone that far. But, you know, so the, the first, the, there does seem to be this template, as you say, with tobacco. With ayahuasca, and this is the second part of the, the answer, yeah. um, I think that to a certain extent, the, the Western word psychedelic is useful. Um, there's a, an extent to which it's not useful in that it it omits that ayahuasca is a body-based experience. When you, when you take ayahuasca, it's, a, it's a, a difficult liquid to swallow. You feel it go down your tubes. Before it, it does anything to your mind, it, it affects your stomach. It mm. makes you nauseous. It purges you. Um, 
it is not just a, a psychedelic, not just a manifester of mind. And in the Western concepts to think about these things, we do have that uh, kind of dichotomy between the mind on the one hand and the body and on the, body the other, effect. which in the Amazonian point of view doesn't exist, the, the separation. They, they don't think in those terms, they don't have those concepts. Um, but that's a, another question. But psychedelic, even though it focuses on the psyche, on the mind, and it does forget about the body, it still has its uses. And so, uh, and I think that what psychedelic substances and plants do is the word means it reveals the psyche. So the idea of the a psychedelic substance is that once you swallow it, what comes to the surface, what comes into your mind is what is already deep down in there, but somehow most of the time is kept under a lid. Yes. It turns out that modern brain imagery, recently, the last five, 10 years, they've shown that this is more or less what happens in the brain with these substances, that there is um, a, a network of neurons called the default mode network mm -hmm. that functions as a kind of central filter. And that most of the time, uh, does not allow all the different brain areas to communicate with one another, but it kind of, it, it filters them. And so that the experience that we usually have of uh, the, all the, the, the essential information that's coming into us and is being interpreted by different parts of the brain is filtered in this way. Mm -hmm. What the psychedelics do by inserting into the serotonin receptors and so forth is it ends up um, knocking out the default mode network. So the, the filter is off and this allows different parts of the brain that normally don't rise into consciousness to rise into consciousness. Okay, and this is where the consciousness expansion filters into the picture, right? Well, it's also where it, so it depends then who you are. It depends what you have in your psyche, uh, what your traumas were. Uh, and I, I think Stan Groff, who invented psychedelic psychotherapy in the 1960s, mm -hmm. said that when you take LSD, you don't have the experience of a drug. You have the experience of yourself. Um, that, so I think that's true to a certain extent. So what if you take ayahuasca and if I take ayahuasca, it would be extremely unlikely that we, we would have the same experience simply because your psyche that will be revealed to you, the psyche that normally isn't revealed to you, but that will be, you will see certain things and my experience will be uh, other things. That said, uh, the Western interpretation of what's going on when you drink ayahuasca is it's, it's all inside the head. Mm. In other words, there's a brain, there's a default mode network, the whole thing is the psyche and the psyche, the lid comes off and you, what comes to the surface is stuff that's already in there. Um, the Amazonian point of view is that um, it, that's not entirely wrong, but they also think that what is going on is information coming from the outside. They think that actually starting with the plant that you've ingested, that what you then see, learn, experience, hear, um, is also relative to the outside world. It's not just all in your head. On the contrary, the point is to uh, enter into communication with other beings, plants, and animals. So I think that there's uh, things that uh, we still need to learn about how the brain works, about consciousness, about modified consciousness. Actually, science has only really been studying consciousness and modified consciousness uh, for 30 years or, or so. So only just getting started. Sh shamans have been studying modified consciousness for thousands of years. And these shamanic cultures have a lot of knowledge about how to navigate in that space and what's going on in there. I mean, uh, these are things that uh, it's all more research is needed, clearly. And yeah. these are questions that, that we need to find out. Um, what I find is interesting, though, that ayahuasca is getting more and more, I don't want to say mainstream, mm. but it is something that people seem to like. And you know what? I'm intrigued by what you were just saying compared to the effect of tobacco. Um, you know, one is more template. I just put it really simple. So please forgive me for that. Um, a bit more uh, black and white. With Ayuhashka, I can find out potentially more about myself. And I think this is very, very intriguing in many ways. So uh, 
can it be used, for example, by science as a lie detector or who is really the person? Can I say, I don't know what's going on with me. I really, I just cannot somehow categorize what I feel, what I think, what I should feel, what I should think. And then ingest ayahuasca and kind of start seeing more clearly or really what the reality is, whether then I know what to do with it is a different thing, but just to dig deeper through that vehicle. Yes, well, you know that um, the CIA and probably the KGB used LSD in the 50s as a, a lie detector um, in, in uh, often cruel experiences. And, um, uh, but their books have been written about this. I, I think it turned out that uh, uh, it was a relatively poor uh, lie detector that that people could be trained to withstand huge doses of LSD and not give away secrets and so forth. But um, you, uh, so I don't think that the, uh, the those agencies actually uh, retained um, that method. That, <laughs> that method of finding out the truth about the and, and it's true. The, these are kind of these are particular peculiar. Um, substances, uh, they're not easy to work with, especially if you're, the, you're into a kind of a CIA view of the world. Plus as well, one dosage on me, and the same dosage on you might have a different effect as well, or strength of it. That's certainly, certainly true. Um, now, in terms of, um, if, if you ask me just on the basis of my experience, I mm -hmm. would say that, yes, uh, working uh, with ayahuasca over the years has allowed me to think about things about myself, but also about uh, the world around us that I perhaps wouldn't have thought about um, uh, quite that way. And so for me, it's like a kind of an, a, an additional uh, perspective or... Well, that's the teaching part of it, right? That's the plant teacher there. That's exactly the plant teacher. Um, uh, but uh, I've got to say that uh, if, if only it were so simple that all anybody had to do was go and drink ayahuasca and then they'd know themselves better, they'd understand the world better, they'd know more, and they would therefore be better equipped to live their lives. If only it were that simple. Uh, what I've seen in practice, so you, you get a lot of people who take ayahuasca and who are very enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, and you know, this needs to be studied, but uh, I don't know, 80, 90% of people who, who say that it's fantastic and it was really good for them. And it's true, there's been self-selection because the first thing to say is that it's just like not everybody's cup of tea. It really is a minority thing. Uh, you know, I would say like at most two or three percent of the population are, are the kind of people that, that are, ha, will have ease or, or will be attracted to the experience. And those who are not attracted to it, uh, they probably do well from abstaining. That would always be my advice. When in doubt, uh, abstain. Yeah. <laughs> when in doubt, leave it out. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, but And so the ones that do uh, gravitate towards ayahuasca and try it, uh, they tend to be quite enthusiastic, quite vocal. One has the impression that ayahuasca is very widespread. I think it's also that those who take it talk about it a lot. So actually, they're not that numerous, but they, they seem to be quite, quite vocal about it because it had an impact, an interesting impact, and one they would want to repeat. Um, yeah, you know, that's also something that, that I've been surprised by because personally, for me, I, ayahuasca is like an ordeal. I, I waited eight years between uh, after the first ayahuasca experience that I describe uh, in my book, uh, The Cosmic Serpent. Uh, I waited eight years before repeating it. And it was the, the time to sort of integrate, think about, uh, get a distance from, uh, write about the... the uh, initial experience and and now that uh so that was more than so that was 27 years ago when i finally wrote the book and then returned to drinking ayahuasca since then i've uh, had it uh i don't know once or twice a year every year more or less um on average and i wouldn't want to do it 
more often than that, um, I, I, for me, it always takes about a year to integrate a strong ayahuasca experience. It's kind of like going to the dentist, really. It's, yeah. it's, it's something that you, that it's it's an ordeal whilst it's happening. I mean, you know, you feel nauseous and you vomit, and it's 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 hard. And at the same time, it's also quite exhilarating. And when it's over, you feel great. So when you walk out of the dentist, you know, you're it's a <laughs> um, and, and and it, but it's something that once you once you walk out of the dentist, so you say, okay, well, I'll, I'll be back in twelve months. But you, it's not like, ooh, I want to come back next week. Yeah, uh, but uh, let me just. Uh... <laughs> Ask that then, Jeremy. Now that, that you basically say, okay, I take that now on a more regular basis, even though the time in between is long. And earlier you said, you know, it gave me a, a different perspective. It actually, that for me, I would interpret it, I expanded, I learned, and I now am able to change, you know, to see um, the world in a different way. So I evolved. Do you feel that you continue to evolve with every Ayahuasca experience? Well, um, I think it uh, depends on um, who you are and what you're thinking about. But mm -hmm. there's a, a fellow called Belly, Benny Shannon who's written a book called The Antipodes of the Mind, Charting the Phenomenology of the Ayahuasca Experience. Um, and uh, what he said um, on the basis of his own experience and on those of other people was that what was remarkable about ayahuasca was that It was like uh, teaching at university. So you, you'd have like the first 10 experiences would be like a semester. Mm -hmm. And then the next 10 experiences would be like a second semester. And then a third and then a fourth. And that what was remarkable is that um, by the time you get to the seventh semester, you're still building on the first six. Um, no single course or lesson is like any other. And you realize that there's this, this uh, long uh, experience of, um, and it also seems to be tailor-made in, in terms of, this is what you need to know uh, at this point in your life. About you. Or about what you're thinking about or what you think you're thinking about. Yeah, what touches about. you. Yeah, what yeah. actually moves you. And, and that is, know, I think, that, yeah, sorry. You, you may think when you go into the experience, ah, I want to think about this and I want to learn about that. And then suddenly, boom, you get kicked in the pants and you get shown all kinds of other things and you don't even understand why. And then you come back the next day, what was all that about? And sometimes it will take years to understand, ah, I get it. Um, But that's, you know, a, that's, a, that's a fun thing about getting into the subconscious, right? Well, for example, I can give a, an example of one thing that I learned that was uh, really fundamental, and it come, came out of my first um, ayahuasca uh, experience. It, uh, it, it, it had barely started that I saw these enormous fluorescent serpents, and they started explaining to me what a tiny human being I was. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt uh, at that point um, my, my humanist, rationalist uh, worldview collapse. I could see that they were right and that actually human was part of a much larger picture of biological life around the planet it was it it was uh, an antidote to the anthropocentrism of anthropology i was a young anthropologist a, a human who studies humans and this experience showed me humans is only one small part of the picture It took, um, it finally, eight, it was eight years later as I was writing The Cosmic Serpent that I read, so, uh, and I became an anthropologist who wrote about biology. Um, uh, plants are important. Um, animals are important. Life on Earth is important. Um, it's, uh, human beings are just a small part of it. Um, And there was a tendency in my education, in my culture, and, uh, and in my profession as an anthropologist to, to be focused on humans. I think Western humans are very focused on humans. You know, you look at most magazine covers, uh, they have humans on them. Humans buy magazines with humans. I mean, they also buy magazines with monkeys on the cover or, or plants, but mainly humans or uh, Western humans are focused on other humans. This Amazonian plant mixture made me attentive uh, way ahead of time. If I'd, Perhaps I would have reached these ideas anyway. 
Um, but it certainly was, they showed me uh, immediately. Uh, they kind of knocked me off my own pedestal. Mm. I didn't really know what to do with that. It took years to finally get it together and say, oh, yes, I get it. I get it. Um, and since then, I've been trying to, to follow that line. So th that's a kind of example of thing. Yeah, that, yeah. it, it made you also develop in your professional life. And if I was a psychologist, my question would be to myself, listening to your story, Jeremy, is, okay, your childhood trauma, let me call it this way, to arrive as a 10-year-old Canadian boy into Switzerland, where everything was different, the language, the people, the culture, the environment, one does feel small. I mean, uh, being a child or not being a child, I wonder whether there is also an, a parallel between that very distinctive moment of period in your life to the experience you had drinking that drink. Well, um, actually, uh, for me, the, the moment where uh, it ceased to be a trauma, to use your word, um, and it actually turned into something um, useful, was after living two years with Ashan Inca people, having several experiences like the tobacco and the ayahuasca experience that I described, um, but then turning my back on all that and completing the study of the rational uses of the rainforest by the Ashan Inca, I finally came back to Switzerland where my family uh, lived. And the, uh, f the, the question was, um, okay, so am I Canadian? Am I American? Am I Swiss? Uh, I'm coming back from Peru. I was living with Ashaninka people. So um, maybe I should become Swiss. At that point, I only had a Canadian passport. Uh -huh. And so I started the process of, of becoming Swiss and realized that, in fact, I didn't feel Swiss. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually, so, and at this point, I was getting close to 30 years old. And I realized that, okay, so I was a foreigner in Switzerland. I'd been a foreigner in Peru. I'd been a foreigner in the United States. I'd even in, in England too. And it, it was, there was always something heavy about being an outsider. At this point, I realized, and I, I read uh, the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss. He said, the anthrop anthropologist is a professional outsider because when you're in the Amazon, you're an outsider, and then that experience changes you. And when you come back to where you're from, you're an outsider too. Yeah. And, and that is uh, the gaze of the anthropologist. It's an outsider's gaze. And I thought, that's it. That's who I am. I found that instead of feeling like I'm running after an identity and I don't know what my identity is, actually, that is my identity of being an outsider. And I feel entirely in my place as a Canadian passport holder living in Switzerland, working as an anthropologist. I am an anthropologist because I am a professional foreigner. Ah, I finally know who I am. Um, so what you call the trauma of the 10-year-old extracted from the culture, yeah, I'm sure there was a tension there of, of being that uh, outsider taken uh, away from the, the place he grew up. But then finally, turning it into, um, yeah, you know, so in other words, it, it, it took that tension yep. to be resolved into, uh, to turn it into this new alloy, really. Yeah, and I think this is super exciting. And I think you described yourself like a tourist on the planet. Uh, to, to be honest with you, when I researched about you, I see you as an architect building bridges, really trying to, to get, uh, you know, the, the Western knowledge to indigenous, but more importantly, uh, the indigenous knowledge that we lost as a developed society. We, once upon a time, I guess, we're also living with the planet, with the plants, with the, the animals. And I feel in your work, what you're trying to, to do is build bridges and understanding and not a, this is right and this is wrong, but this is it kind of picture. That's right. That's exactly right. And actually, in terms of um, talking about bridges, you remember the bridge in Avignon? Yeah. Um, so there are two popes and they were going to uh, build uh, half the bridge and, and meet halfway and reconcile religion. And anyway, one of the popes built his half and then the other pope didn't. And so that's the bridge in Avignon. It's a half a bridge. Um, 
In terms of um, uh, science and indigenous knowledge, um, my view as a, an appreciator of bridges um, uh, or one who feels the, the, the need for bridges is that indigenous Amazonian people ha have built their part of the bridge. Um, they have no problem considering that uh, Western science is valid. Um, they're interested in Western science. Mm. They think that their knowledge is also valid. Uh, they understand that science has a hard time taking them into consideration. But frankly, they have no trouble um, dialoguing with scientists, taking scientific uh, knowledge into consideration, and so on. And that's also what Rafaela and I show in this book. Um, they just we, don't like the extraction part. The go, consume, get, and just, you know, I don't know, profit. Well, from. for the moment, uh, if you ask most uh, scientists, um, they find it difficult to go towards indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. and take it into consideration. In fact, that's almost one of the, it's, and it's not because they're small-minded, it's because that's the method of science. It, it presupposes that it is the only valid way of knowing. It does not have that uh, uh, epistemological openness to the, uh, the, the possibility that there might be another valid way of knowing things that would be expressed differently. You know, if, if, if science can't measure it, then it doesn't exist. Yes. And so, and then everybody who plays, who, who, who does science, who practices science has to follow those rules. And so they don't want to get caught taking other forms of knowledge seriously. So their side of the bridge to move towards the other side uh, doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Uh, and, th and that's where we stand. Yeah, and I think there's parallels also in medicine. You have functional medicine, you've got the uh, traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, and then you have the classical medicine that you are being taught, you know, um, and the approach there is very functional. Okay, this is what your pathology is, and this is the remedy instead of seeing everything holistically. And we've, we've seen these tensions and, and different thoughts about it. But if I, had, if I had to ask you, Jeremy, and we have to start concluding our conversation, you need to get back to writing your new book. Um, if you uh, had to recommend to, you know, try it out and try to expand your consciousness or go on a trip in a positive sense, would you? Would you say, yeah, try Ayuhashka or don't? No, um, I think that, uh, and I thank you for the question because it's important to, to say, um, my opinion is that nobody should ever recommend that anybody try a hallucinogen. And the reason for this is simple and clear. Um, you cannot know how borderline you are until you've swallowed the substance. So this is a psychedelic, we'll go back to that word, um, and uh, psychedelics and hallucinogens have the power to um, uh, bring out psychosis. Um, somebody who's on the limits of psychosis, so it's not for people with psychotic issues, not for people who are borderline, not for people who have schizophrenia in their family. Um, uh, and. And th that's the thing, because it, it's your psyche. It's not anybody else's psyche. And so you necessarily take a risk with your psyche when you take a psychedelic. And there's no way around that. And so people, w what one can do is uh, make information available to people, which is what we try to do in this book. If you are going to take the risk with your psyche, if you are interested in working with these powerful plants, well, this is what you probably need to know if you're going to be fully informed before making that decision. Um, you know, so that's, that's it. I, I, I would recommend, uh, on the contrary, in fact, that before people uh, go into the deep water of uh, working with one of these powerful plants, um, that they... Um, get information about it. It's like, you just compare it to go, going climbing in the Himalayas or going sailing on the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you, know, mm -hmm. you, you can't just go with your shorts and t-shirt and running shoes. You know, you need to 
read books about it, go down to the equipment store. Be and maybe also get a guide. Get you a know, guide. I wonder about it. You know, with ayahuasca, that's also pretty clear because you can dabble with certain plants, but ayahuasca needs a pilot. Um, personally, I'm, uh, when I take ayahuasca, it's uh, always with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, and it, it is a kind of a vehicle. And the, the shaman does act as a kind of pilot. And, you know, personally, I don't f uh, fly airplanes, but I sometimes get into an airplane and I want the pilot to be uh, trained. Make sure you're safe. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So, so that would be the uh, that would be the heads up on on these powerful plants and and a lot of a lot of time people don't really know what they're doing you know they they're not fully informed and they have sort of an idea and oh I'll just try that and so forth no, um, no. you know no no so. no you know I have a, I have a 17 year old daughter and I cannot say that uh, certain uh, like cannabis etc is not flying about in the school um, and that uh, you know in this kind of age they they uh, tend to go on a trip uh, whatever you believe your daughter tells you whether she does or does not I'm not going to say anything about this but I think um, my my ultimate question also is you know I do meditation I did hypnosis but drugs is something Something that has always scared me. You know, I, if you are somebody who likes to be in control, um, has a fairly balanced approach between emotion and your rational mind, uh, it always scared me. So I always abstained, if in doubt, leave it out. Uh, on the other hand, I wonder to what extent I could really find out more, knowing I've already found out quite a bit through hypnosis, regression therapy, uh, and also meditation, Do I, I go and I get into a different level, whether that would be something that it's not, you know, you'll use drugs, you're a druggie, but you use it in a medicinal way, like cannabis is being more and more used in a medicinal way. Well, you know, one thing that you, you could do um, is uh, check out, um, uh, what's it called, the breathing... Um, Uh, the, it'll come back to me. Uh, it's a psychotropic uh, breathing. It's a method that Stan uh, Groff invented. Mm -hmm. um, you do um, uh, rhythmed and deep breathing on music, and it, it puts you into a kind of a trance state. Uh, hol holotropic breathing. Holotropic. Holotropic, mm -hmm. holotropic breath work. Okay. And it's a method that Stan Groff, the, um, the, the fellow who... Uh, invented psychedelic psychotherapy in the 1960s, uh, developed when LSD was made illegal. And so that you can actually, um, uh, it, it takes some discipline, it takes some work, and you've got to breathe heavily and deliberately. And it's not everybody's cup of tea either, but it, it does allow people to have remarkable <clears throat> visionary experiences um, that are analogous to psychedelic experiences, but without taking any drug whatsoever. Yes, yes. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting one with the breathing <clears throat> because I do uh, do breathing exercises and one of them are called the espresso breathing, which is a very fast in and out breathing to wake up in the morning. And I uh -huh. do uh, a certain amount of cycles of doing that. And then I do another breathing to just calm down my vagus nerve. And I see the different uh, physiological effects The different breathing methods have, but I've not been hallucinating yet. I've not, I've not jumped off our balcony yet because of my espresso breathing in the morning. But well, that's actually an excellent, excellent way to maybe get closer to the idea. Well, if you're experienced with disciplining your breath and working with it and, and doing th something other than just breathing normally, uh, then you'll probably find practicing holotropic breathing fairly easy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that if you wanted to use that method and to go into it, trance state rather than an espresso state, you would probably find that fairly easy. And so that, that would allow you to kind of like put your, your big toe in the water and see what it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, will. I will. Well, listen, um, Jeremy, the last question I ask all of my guests, what is from this really enlightening book? It's short, it's concise. And I now also know not to put tobacco like an ointment on my skin because that is a real killer, which I thought was so interesting also. And what are your key takeaways you want readers to really, you know, look out for? What was the main message you'd say? Well, that these two plants are um, powerful Uh, interesting. They can be used in different ways, but also to get a better understanding of things. 
But if one is going to work with them, you one needs to be fully informed. And that probably the best way to be fully informed about these plants is to have both the scientific and the shamanic perspective. And so the, the takeaway message on that count is that these two forms of knowledge uh, work together uh, easily. That if your mind is open enough, you can see the scientific perspective, you can see the shamanic perspective, you can see how they correspond, and you can see how they can be used together, kind of like in a form of bilingualism. That the takeaway message is we can become bilingual. Uh, we can see things through two different systems of knowledge, and we have more concepts that way. Bilinguals have more fun. That's the message. Absolutely. Bilinguals have more fun. They understand more. And I think the key word here definitely is stay open-minded. And there is not one truth. There's always the truth from whatever perspective, whatever context you're approaching any kind of issue. Jeremy, thank you so much for writing this book, Plant Teachers, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge, together with Rafael Chankari, Chankari uh, Pizzuri. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, uh, all the best in writing and publishing your new book. And then I would like to have you back on the show. Okay. With pleasure, Patricia. Thank you. And thank you, my dear Mentorit TV community. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Dr. Jeremy Narby as much as I did. You know, these kind of issues are always so that they can polarize, but read the book, get it, read the book, make up your own mind and take or don't take uh, actions upon that. Until next time, our tagline here is stay curious. I see you then.